Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to continue looking at structural unemployment, specifically labor market rigidities, which are factors that uh, do not allow free market forces of supply and demand to operate uh, because perhaps government intervention, minimum wage, labor unions, and their ability to collectively bargain and raise wages or benefits, employment protection laws, these all cause cost of production to rise and uh, do not enable firms to employ as many laborers as they would like because they have to pay uh, more uh, in employee benefits, uh, compensation, and so on. One way to contrast um, the impact of labor market rigidities on unemployment is to look at the United States versus the European Union. The purple line here illustrates unemployment in the United States. And the blue line represents European nations or the uh, EU unemployment in the European zone or the Eurozone. And we can see that the in the European Union, unemployment is typically higher, right? Perhaps between eight and ten percent. Whereas the United States, unemployment is between four and six percent. So that's a pretty significant difference between the two. And generally speaking, we can see that European Union uh, strong socialist policies to protect labor, making it costly to, for firms to fire labor uh, because they're required to pay compensation for each year that they've worked and so forth. That um, really creates a level of structural unemployment that disincentivizes firms from their ability to hire workers. If laborers Labor, workers are well protected and uh, it's difficult or costly to fire, then firms are more reluctant to hire because if they hire and it doesn't work out, it'd be costly to fire. So they're very careful uh, when they employ individuals. Whereas in the United States, there is reduced labor market rigidities, much easier to hire and fire. And thus, uh, firms are able to employ more workers if it doesn't work out they fire them and then you have that incentive to be more productively efficient uh, because if you're not, you're, you're able to be easily fired. But because of the ability to easily hire and fire in the United States, there's reduced structural unemployment versus the Eurozone, okay, which we can see between these two lines. So just a quick overview. Again, we're looking at structural unemployment the phenomenon of labor market rigidities. And that's basically another word for saying uh, policies or legislation that makes it difficult to hire and fire, such as uh, employment protection laws, the government intervening, passing laws to protect workers, making it costly to firms to fire labor. And that in, in effect reduces the incentive to hire. Where in the United States, it's easier to hire and fire leading to reduced structural employment. Labor unions and their ability to collectively bargain for higher wages or employee benefits, that increases costs of production and reduces the ability of firms to employ more workers. In addition, um, unemployment benefits provided by the government rate may reduce the incentive for those who are unemployed and receiving welfare to actively look for work. Um, some countries, perhaps, they offer unemployment benefits for about six months. And so since it's a shorter period of time, you know, you're perhaps more actively looking for a job because those six months will go by quickly. Whereas in another country, maybe they're offering unemployment benefits for two years. And since you have a, a large two-year cushion to look for a job, maybe you're not as actively looking for a job. And so perhaps you're, you're part of that unemployment statistic uh, and also contribute to a level of structural unemployment. And also minimum wage legislation that increases um, wages paid by firms, which is a cost of production to firms, and that reduces their ability to employ as many workers as they would like. So these four aspects, minimum wage, labor unions, employment protection laws, unemployment benefits, uh, well, predominantly the first three, increases the cost of production for the firm. So let's go ahead and illustrate that. Just using a simple micrograph, we have the market for output quantity of output on the x-axis, price of those outputs on the y-axis, and we'll have our upward sloping supply curve, labeled S1, equal to our marginal costs of production. And then we'll have our demand for those outputs, or goods and services, 
by households, downward sloping, according to our law of demand, labeled D1, which is equal to our marginal benefit. And the intersection of the two establishes our free market equilibrium at point A. And then we have a price established in the free market for those outputs at P1, and a quantity supply and demanded of those outputs at Q1. And in Q1, we were going to remember that quantity supplied is equal to quantity demanded. It is in equilibrium. So minimum wage legislation. All right, is wages for low-skilled workers rises. Or labor unions and their ability to collectively bargain for higher wages or increased employee benefits. And or employment protection laws, making it more costly to fire labor or laws that require firms to provide certain benefits to their employees and so on, that increases the costs of production. And that would lead to an upward or inward shift of the supply curve from S1 to S2. All right? This is reflective of the costs of production rising, firms having to pay more for each uh, unit of labor as a result of these interventions, labor unions, minimum wage, employment protection laws, the same as an inward shift of the supply curve. Okay, so we're going to hold price constant at P1, and we'll see that the quantity supplied now is at point B. So we'll draw another line here to reflect that the quantity supplied at Q2 is less than the quantity being demanded. Right, so here we see quantity demanded at Q1 is greater than the quantity supplied. So that puts upward pressure on prices. So in the long run, price gravitates upwards and it's until it reaches this new equilibrium at point C, where S2 equals D1. And that will create the new long run price of oops, P2. So prices of outputs rise as the cost of production rise. Higher wages for employees, more benefits being provided to employees, that raises the cost of production. So the price will also have to rise. Right, so those higher uh, costs are being passed on to the, to the consumer. Um, at point C, where S2 equals D1, we have the new equilibrium established now at Q3. And we've reached equilibrium again at Q3, quantity supply equals quantity demanded. So we can use a simple microeconomic graph to illustrate a type of structural unemployment, arguing that minimum wage increases the cost of production. S1 shifts up to S2. Labor unions bargaining for higher wages or more employee benefits increases the cost of production S1 to S2. And as a result of that reduced quantity being supplied from Q1 to Q3, the quantity between Q1 and Q3 kind of illustrates the reduced output and also the reduced number of employees that firms require. So the, the, the distance between Q1 and Q3 also illustrates not only the reduced quantity of output, but also the reduced demand for employees creating structural unemployment between Q1 and Q3. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and analyze this as we would for a paper exam, and that will be it. As can be seen, we have a market uh, for output, graph A, illustrating this. We're measuring quantity of output on the x-axis, price on the y-axis. We have a downward sloping demand curve according to the law of demand, labeled D1, equal to our marginal benefit, and an upward sloping supply curve, S1, according to the law of supply, equal to our marginal costs of production. Free market equilibrium at where S1 equals D1 provides an equilibrium price at P1 and an equilibrium quantity at Q1 where the quantity supplied is equal to the quantity demanded. All right, so we're at equilibrium. But as a result of uh, minimum wage or wages rising for low-skilled workers or labor unions uh, collectively bargaining for higher wages or more employee benefits, this would increase the cost of production and that would lead to the supply curve rising from S1 to S2. All right, so we see that S1 shifts to S2. In the short run, we're gonna hold price constant.
at P1. And we'll see that at P1, the quantity supplied is equal to Q2, and the quantity demanded is equal to Q1. And that illustrates that we have quantity demanded at Q1 greater than quantity supplied. So that effectively creates a shortage, which leads to price rising. Price starts to rise from P1 to P2. And as it rises, we see that the quantity supplied along the S2 curve rises from point B to point C, or from Q2 to Q3. Right? In addition, we see that as the price rises, the quantity demanded along D1 starts to go down from point A to C, or from Q1 to Q3, until we reach a new equilibrium where S2 equals D1 with a new long-run equilibrium price of P2 and quantity supply demanded at Q3. All right. Thus, this, this model illustrates how these labor market rigidities increasing the cost of production from S1 and S2 raises the price of output, reduces the quantity being provided into the market from Q1 to Q3, and also reduces the ability of firms to employ as many employees as they had before. The increased cost reduces the firm's ability to employ. They may have to fire some workers uh, to reduce their quantity of output from Q1 to Q3. And that's it. I'll provide a, few, a full out, outline of the analysis in the information section below. If you have any questions, feel free to comment. And don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.